Hello, I'm Laura Jacobs, and I'm recording this conference from the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron Wendat. The work described in this project was undertaken on unceded indigenous lands of the Kenyankehaka Nation, recognized as a custodian of the lands and the waters of the Teotihuacan. These waters have long served as a place for many First Nations to live, meet, and exchange. The object described in this conference was produced in the 60s, a time not so long ago when indigenous children in Canada were forcefully taken from their families, losing their names, languages, and connection to heritage. As part of the Master of Art Conservation given at Queen's University, Canada, I had the opportunity to complete a summer internship placement at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. This museum holds some of Canada's most impressive collection of design. Under the supervision of Nathalie Richard, conservator of the Decorative Arts Department of the MMFA, and Richard Gagné, head of the Conservation Department, a diverse set of interesting projects was completed. My goal for this presentation is to talk about the thought process surrounding the treatment of one of the objects I encountered during my internship at the MMFA. I will walk you through the design and history along with the manufacturing process that created it. I will then show you the state the object was in when I first approached it, followed by the ethical reasoning and the decisions that were made to treat it. The portrait of my mother's Chesterfield is a chair made entirely from polyurethane ether foam. It was conceived by hand by the Danish design artist Gunnar Arger Andersen between 1964 and 1965. This specific chair is one of 11 from the same series made by Andersen within the Dansk Polyeter industry at Frederiksund, Denmark. The use of new technology in the making of this object was primary to its interest in design history, seeing as polyurethane was first introduced commercially in the 1950s. The artist was instigating new pathways that connect craftsmanship and industrialization. This chair is part of the anti-design movement, showcasing an opulent copy of the original, more traditional form. It's also an interesting design piece because it's made only with one material, polyurethane ether, and no internal support structure. Anderson produced these chairs through a series of experimentations with the new material. By hand mixing freon and water with hydroxyls and iso isocyanides, he could generate a product filled with air, yet yielding with elasticity, exposing a leather-like finish to the surface. The first chairs he produced were mixed without the use of pigments. This can be seen by the white interior of some of his earlier productions. He would also hose the foam preparation directly onto the floor. The polyurethane would expand and cure, allowing for a second layer of foam to be poured onto the first. The early specimens, intrinsically white, were then painted in dark brown. As he continued with his exploration, his techniques changed. He switched the hose for a bucket to pour down the layers on his chairs and added pigments to the mixture. These changes would produce large chocolate-like masses without the need for post-treatment. The chair owned by the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts is one of the la latter ones, with brown coloration throughout the layers and thick drip-like waves dropping down. This chair, when presented to me at the start of my internship, was stored in the area designated for the decorative arts object. It was enclosed in a cotton dust cover on a wooden crate, separated from the wood only by a thin sheet of mylar. Unfortunately, the chair seemed to have shifted from its original position, leaving the interfacing material useless for certain areas. Cotton fibers from the dust cover were embedded in the material, allowing dust bunnies to form at the bottom of the chair. The polyurethane foam was showing many signs of embrittlement, especially near the base of the object where it was in contact with the wood. Fortunately, the rest of the surface was still yielding to slight pressure. Losses were apparent and some pieces were ripped off, probably due to previous handling incidents. This chair was originally owned by an individual with a private collection, and it appears people used it as furniture in their living spaces before it was donated to the museum. As such, there was quite some damage for use. Fibers from colorful clothing were stuck in the material, the armrests and seat were heavily abraded, and what were previously air pockets had been picked out. This chair was collected by the museum as a snapshot of new technology at that time, 
made to showcase the new techniques and experimentative skills of the artist. Although the degradation aspect of this material holds some interest to me as a conservator, its degraded state does not fall in accordance with the mission of the museum. Overall, this piece was deemed to be unpresentable and thus stayed in the museum's vault. To research and prepare for this treatment, I completed a lot of readings, looking into the artist's history and case studies on polyurethane foam objects. Van Oosten's book, PUR Facts, and Yvonne Chachua's Conservation of Plastics, were of great help in my understanding of the material and how to approach it. The occasional reading of Barbara Applebaum's Conservation Treatment Methodology also helped me navigate the hardships of planning out a treatment. My treatment would also not have been possible without the help and exchange with the numerous conservators that work at the museum. In order to treat the object, I, I created a table of priorities. I mapped out the problems related to the object and the different treatment decisions I could take. This task included many days of testing different solvents, materials, and prototypes before applying them to the object. Through this process, I learned that this specific material was sensitive to many solvents. For example, the chair's epidermis would swell considerably if a drop of acetone touched it, damaging the leather-like surface permanently. The mechanical cleaning helped me to get acquainted to the chair. It involved many hours of vacuuming the cotton fibers and detangling them from the polyurethane's open cell network with very small tweezers. This was carried out in tandem with the decision-making process that surrounded the treatment of this object. I would ask myself questions like, what was the original color of the material? Did it yellow with time and thus change the way we perceive this object? Because yellowing is an indication of degradation for polyurethane. After being confronted to the manufacturing process that produced harmful off-gassing, interrogations were geared towards the types of additives used and how they assist in the degradation of the chair, and if there were still some health and safety issues that I should be wary of. This segment in Van Oosten's book, PUR Facts, helped me get to grips with the inevitable invasive treatment that was about to take place on this object. And I quote here, As long as polyurethane foam has not lost its structural integrity, Objects can in some cases be restored using traditional techniques that have proven their suitability and are reversible. Objects that have degraded to such an extent that they will soon lose their significance require invasive treatment. For these objects, there is simply no time to wait for a better form of treatment because the condition of the foam is so bad that the object will see soon cease to exist altogether. Reversibility is not an issue when the chosen method is essentially a last result. End quote. So, Portrait of My Mother's Chesterfield, acquisition 1987, and removed from the exhibition space in 2002, fell in the category of the unshowable. I decided to avoid the application of a consolidation layer to the total of the chair. It would imply using new techniques that had only been tested on smaller scale objects and would need the use of the vacuum chambers big enough for the chair. The possibility of making a huge mistake was high, resulting in the removal of the object from exhibition spaces. I consolidated the object in necessary areas only, where the layers were delaminating and where the open cell network was exposed. Another big hurdle to go over was the mimicking of the odd surface texture presented by the chair in order to recreate the lost elements. At first, we were investigating the avenue of using store-bought polyurethane foam and squirting it on the object. This would recreate the random conformations made by the dripping foam, as well as mimic the yield and leather-like skin of the chair. The idea was not pushed forward because future conservators would have similar problems having to remove the new polyurethane from the old, having to figure out what additives are used and how they interact with each other. The other option was to sculpt a form from an existing piece of foam. Unfortunately, this is easier said than done, and trying to find conservation-grade foam with a leather-like texture is not easy. I would run around the labs and look for new materials I hadn't heard from yet, try to find new ways of using them, as well as ask any conservator who was there working that day. I did tests on foam pieces that were laying around by gluing paper and paper-like materials ranging from Japanese paper to the non-woven polyester material Holitex onto the surface of my test foams. Through those tests, I noticed that the paper finish glued to the surface of the foam was similar to that leathery skin of the chair, but the paper strips would eventually delaminate from each other. So, 
Covering the foam cake carvings reminded me of making piñatas using papier mâché from when I was a child in birthday parties, and that gave me an idea. What if I ruled out the use of foam and just used outside paper? I revisited my strategy and decided upon the creation of a paper shell that would then be adhered to the chair. To choose the right type of material used for my paper shells, I took a piece of carved out foam and tested the different results I would get with the material, taking notes on how it would dry and what sort of surface finish it would provide. My best results were from paper pulp provided by the paper conservator at the MMFA. Seeing as there was only one box of this material, we tried to order some more and call the initial company as well as some paper making factories and couldn't find any. I even lost quite some time trying to make my own homemade paper pulp fiber from buffer paper. First, I created the form that I wished to see on the object using a non-hardening plasticine clay. I would model it directly on the chair and use a thin mylar sheet to protect and separate the waxy material from the object. With an extra set of hands, I could take a step back and change my viewing angle to determine if the shape was appropriate or not. It's important to understand that those loss compensations were created with no reference material for the specific chair, seeing as it was acquired with missing pieces already. Using a two-part activated polysilicin casting material, usually used by dentists, I would create the negative of the shell and add the paper fibers to it. The material is prepared by mixing the paper fiber with a solution of 3% Clusil G dispersed in ethanol. This adhesive is well documented in paper conservation as well as leather conservation and is used mainly in bookbinding. The shells would be cured before coming in contact with the polyurethane foam, thereby posing no threat to the object in terms of sen solvent sensitivity. Once cured, they were adhered to the Chesterfield. At this point, I was pretty happy with the way my treatment was going. I didn't have to do those fills directly on the object. The use of paper molds to recreate the losses was the best option within the constraints given by the museum environment and in respect to the object. It is a way of showcasing the most reversibility as well as integrity to the appearance of the chair without drawing attention to the fact that it was an additional piece of material. It's lightweight, blends in, and closes off the open cell network of the polyurethane foam from the outside environment. This treatment was successful for its aesthetic appearance and results using conservation gray materials and retaining a level of reversibility. The experimentation stage of the paper shells allowed me to solve other neighboring challenges to this object. Here are a few variations that this method provided. Pre-binded paper fiber from previous tests was recycled for a structural reinforcement, acting like padding inside of a ruptured bubble. This same technique was also used to cover up abraded holes by the armrests. For more complicated three-dimensional compensations, I was able to glue pieces together to make an all-round mold for the loss. For those who wish to try a similar technique, I have a little piece of advice. It's difficult to correct the shape of a shell after it cured, even with a sharp tool. The paper would tear off in clumps instead and it was time-consuming to adjust. The best is to have achieved the highest level of precision at every step of the process. In certain areas, fresh paper pulp was added directly to the object. The lack of reversibility in these key damaged areas on the chair was thoroughly discussed with my supervisors before going ahead with the invasive treatment. It is in the hope of having helped other students' own decision-making process and building confidence with new materials that I presented this conference. I would like to thank Nathalie Richard, my supervisor at the museum, who encouraged me to push my limits and to be brave in the unknown, and I encourage you to do the same. Thank you very much.